In chapter two, we will review three categories of approaches to valuation. This is foundational uh, for most of quantitative finance. Uh, finance generally rests on two pillars, valuation and management. And this focus early in the book, it will be on valuation. And to really understand um, the different techniques and approaches to valuation, I've, I have found it extremely helpful to categorize um, the different approaches into, into uh, these three categories. To motivate this particular discussion, let's consider how you would value a residential house. Uh, typically, uh, residential houses are appraised by looking at uh, recent sales of similar houses. If we contrast that with how do you value a common stock, uh, John Burrow Williams in the 1930s um, uh, posited that uh, the value of a common stock is simply the present value of the future dividend payments, and thus the whole uh, uh, present value of free cash flow or net income or whatever your preferred valuation method is, uh, is unique to, to uh, many financial instruments. Basically, you project expected future cash flows. You discount them back at some uh, what you would deem as appropriate risk-adjusted discount rate. And then finally, how do you actually value an option contract? Well, the Nobel Prize winning Black Scholes Merton model was built on the no arbitrage principle and introduced a unique way of valuing financial derivatives that has become known as risk neutral valuation methods, or I actually prefer the equivalent martingale method uh, because we don't assume risk neutrality. And these three approaches are in fact different, but why? And so if you consider, uh, if I were to ask you to value a particular house, this picture comes from unsplash.com. It is a website that provides free uh, uh, pictures that, that you, you're welcome to use. And this is a particularly nice one. And, and you get the idea that if, if my task was to value this home, well, I would look for similarly uh, valued houses. If I were to value a common stock, now I lost the source of this picture, um, but um, well, basically back in the day of actual physical shares, you could you can just imagine the challenge of valuing a particular common stock. Uh, there's actually an entire industry of ancient common stocks as uh, collectibles, just as an aside. Or how do you value an option? One of the key things to remember about options is that they are contracts and not securities, uh, but they also generally are valued in a unique way. So before we dive into these three categories of approaches to valuation to um, address how you value a house versus a stock versus an option, I think it's important to rummage around a bit on presuppositions. There are basically four presuppositions. Uh, the uh, rational intelligibility of the universe is one, uh, but uh, beyond that, um, uh, the idea that we have well-defined property rights, it's, it's, I find it difficult to conceive of valuing an instrument in a culture that denies property rights. And so according to Case, uh, property rights, uh, rights to control use, transfer things broadly conceived, including rights in intangibles such as intellectual property. Uh, in, in the United States, where I'm fi filming this, we still have respect for intellectual property, and often that property is uh, patented or trademarked or in some way protected um, through copyright, uh, and that is actually uh, housed within different companies. There's, a, there's a, an action that used to be quite common, and hopefully it's not anymore, known as naked short selling, um, and that's where you don't borrow the shares from short selling, and that actually denigrates uh, property rights. So for some companies, there are more shares outstanding than there are shares outstanding, and so when you vote your shares, they actually uh, average them down because more shares vote than there's actually shares outstanding. And, and so the degree to which we have uh, 
clear, well-defined property rights uh, um, is very important into how we value uh, different instruments. We also have to have clear rule of law. If somebody steals my car, I need to, uh, some way to uh, get justice and get my property back. Uh, and the degree to which a society is bound by law is committed to the process that allows property rights to be secure under legal rules that will be applied predictably and not subject to the whims of particular individual matters. And so uh, the clear rule of law and, and an example of a breach is insider trading, which violates the uh, typically the insider's fiduciary duty to serve the interest of their shareholders uh, and, and not themselves. And, and the degree to which insider trading is uh, enforced and justice is provided that enhances the value of all financial instruments in that culture. Finally, uh, a culture of trust. Uh, features of trust, someone is, uh, rely on someone with something valuable. Uh, you, you make yourself vulnerable and confident. Uh, trusted will not exploit and will care for you. Uh, it's a means of making business simpler and safer. I've, I've been in the consulting business for over 35 years, and the fact that I trust uh, the people hiring me, they trust me, makes contracting just so much easier. Uh, without uh, uh, the foundation of trust, uh, Hobbes uh, pointed out that uh, life without a state, there would be war of every man against every man. Life would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Uh, not something that I would find attractive. Uh, another uh, presupposition that we'll make, this is more of a, a, a practical uh, assumption that's, that's there uh, in the ability to map uncertainties. Uh, uncertainties related to future activities and events are mappable. Uh, mapping is almost always subjective within the context of financial valuation. The future is a very unique um, a challenge in uh, time itself. We, we're familiar with time, but if you start digging deep, it's a, it's a very complicated concept to, to deeply understand. But basically, time moves in one direction and the future is uncertain. We will often model it in a risk perspective, assuming we know the probability distribution when in fact we don't. Uh, this is not flipping a coin or rolling die financial markets are never at that level of precision in uh, the probability space. And so we have to take great care uh, when, when applying models that, that we hold the results of our model uh, with, a, uh, with the appropriate level of epistemic uncertainty. That is, we need to be honest about the degree to which we are, our claims are tentative. Some standard assumptions without <clears throat> getting uh, too far down in the weeds. We generally assume an in, a finite time horizon. We have a complete probability space. Uh, omega, that's a capital omega right here. <clears throat> and it's a set of all possible realizations. For example, in a three month call option, if I map out all the possible paths that I'd say an underlying stock price can go, Omega represents all the possible paths through maturity. The sigma field of distinguishable event, events can be thought of as uh, every single path and the likelihood of that path occurring. And then we, can, we assume that we can assign some probability to those different paths. Uh, in this particular material, we'll model uncertainty with a variety of different Brownian motions. Uh, just by way of review, uh, the idea of expected value of X, if I flip a coin and I give you $3 if it lands heads and uh, you give me a dollar if it lands tails, the expected cash flow is $1 in your direction. There is this idea of adjusting for risk, for example, when you value common stocks. One way to adjust for risk is to um, assign a higher probability to uh, outcomes I don't like. And so if I assign a 60% chance of tails, the actual probability is 50, but because I don't like having to pay out money, I might assign 60. And so in, in this case, the expected value under this alternative probability measure is only 60 cents. We'll be using this quite extensively uh, when it comes to uh, 
valuing uh, options and related products. Present value, I'm assuming you have a deep un understanding of present value. At this point, if you don't, I recommend any introductory um, uh, materials. Uh, you can go to Wikipedia and, and rummage around those uh, uh, fundamental concepts. In this, in this particular material, we'll be calculating present value uh, based on some risk-free interest rate um, or some what I'll refer to as a base curve. Uh, in this case, I just take some future cash flow and I discount it over uh, capital T years at an annually compounded interest rate of R sub F, the risk-free rate. If I take the present value of a risk-adjusted rate, the idea is I take the risk-free rate and I add a risk premium. So RP can be thought of as a subjective risk premium. Clearly, uh, if you have a different risk premium than I do, we'll come up with different opinions on what the value of this particular cash flow is. Uh, underneath every uh, uh, problem in finance typically is a problem of valuation. As uh, Arthur Stone Doing pointed out, our focus here is value in exchange, um, not, not uh, value in use. Uh, air is very valuable, but it's free because it's not scarce. Uh, and so to have value, it has to be useful, scarce, requires sacrifice. The reallocation of consumption through financial assets satisfies this notion of value. In this material, uh, we'll take a somewhat of a deep dive into three approaches to valuation, what I'm going to call the market comparables approach, and these are categories of approaches. The market comparables approach um, is simply uh, asset A is comparable to some portfolio of, say, assets B, C, and D. This is widely used, for example, when you look at the value of, of your, the stocks that you own. Typically, people take the number of shares times the closing price, and, and they get the value, the, and they add that up, and they get the value of the portfolio. Well, that is market a, a, a market comparables assumption. The discount factor adjusted approach in its most complicated form, I'm going to be summing over possible states of the world at every point in time. I'm summing over all the different possible points in time. I'm discounting at the risk-free rate for those different points in time. And I'm applying a risk premium to every state at every, po at every point in time across the uh, cash flows. And then the uh, final approach is simply the cash flow adjusted approach, where I'm taking a risk adjusted probability, uh, which is similar to what's known as the certainty equivalent method. And so in the next several videos, we will take a deep dive uh, into these three categories of approaches to valuation. I have found this material to be extremely useful, especially when I'm assigned a task of, of valuing some complicated instrument. Um, market comparables is the easiest, um, but often I can't do that because the instrument is not comparable to something else. And so uh, we will go through these three categories of, pro of approaches to valuation in the next several videos.